This podcast focuses on the pediatric hand exam. Our faculty member is Dr. Donald Bay from the Department of Orthopedic Surgery. Today, Cole's going to help us out going over the basic elements of a hand examination. We're going to talk a little bit about things to look for in inspection, palpation, how to do sensory motor testing, as well as some provocative maneuvers with a focus on injuries that are common and indications for hand surgery referral. Particularly in the young and nonverbal child or in the acutely injured child, you want to try to glean as much information as you can just by looking and by inspection. And part of understanding what's abnormal is understanding what's normal. So it probably makes sense to go over the, some of the surface landmarks and normal structures on the hand. So we'll start with the back of the hand. So um, certainly the thumb and all the fingers have fingernails. Can you make your hand flat for me, Cole? Thank you. Fingernails are what I call the nail plate. The tissue underneath the nail by the pulp is referred to as the hyponychium. And then you have the eponychium, which is tissue around. You can see on the hands as well normal creases that live over the distal interphalangeal joint, proximal interphalangeal joint, and metacarpal phalangeal joint. And the absence of these creases can be um, seen either in trauma or even in some congenital situations where there's some abnormal joint or tendon development. Some other uh, things that you can see on the top of the hand and some other landmarks that are very helpful to know. So in Cole's hand and wrist, you can see that when the thumb is extended, uh, a tendon here that pops out, and that's called the extensor pollicis longus tendon. There's another set of tendons that run over on this side of the wrist, and between those tendons, there's a little sulcus right here, and that's what we refer to as the anatomic snuff box. That's a really important surface landmark because the floor of the anatomic snuff box contains the scaphoid bone, and the scaphoid bone is one of the most commonly injured bones and commonly fractured bones in the wrist, and also the one that oftentimes is missed when they present to emergency rooms or other providers. If we turn the palm over and look at the hand, we can see, again, lots of flexion creases. A flexion crease at the distal interphalangeal joint, proximal interphalangeal joint. There's a crease at the border between the palm and the digit. We refer to that as the palmal digital crease. Understand that that crease actually doesn't correspond to a joint but corresponds to the middle of the proximal phalanx and the crease for the metacarpal phalangeal joint is actually here in the palm. Cole's a really strong young man, so you can see these nice muscles here that make up the thenar eminence, the very nice muscles here that make up the hypothenar eminence. And normally those should be a little bit bulging as they are in Cole. Um, and absence of those prominences would suggest that there's been some atrophy or potentially even nerve injuries. One of the most important things um, about the surface landmarks here is that there's a little bony prominence that lives right here. And that's the other end of the scaphoid bone, or what's called the scaphoid tubercle. Again, important to know because you want to be able to find that bone and push on it if you suspect that there's a scaphoid fracture. And then now, this being spring in New England, we're all getting very excited for baseball season. And we want to also be able to palpate a bone that's commonly injured in baseball players. On the ulnar side of the wrist, there's a bony prominence here, and that's called the pisiform bone. And if I put the interphalangeal joint of my thumb on the pisiform and bend the tip down towards the first web, right in here, there's a little bony prominence right there. And that bony prominence represents the hook of the hamate, and that's a bone that's commonly injured, particularly in batsmen and in racket sports. So the real important bony landmarks here are going to be the scaphoid tubercle, pisiform, and hook a handmate. If you look at Cole in the resting position, you see that all his fingers are naturally curled because he has normal muscle tone and that tendinous connections between the muscles and the fingers allow all of us to naturally posture with our hand like this. Another way to get a lot of information in the hand is taking advantage of those muscle and tendon connections to the bone through a phenomenon we refer to as tenodesis. Notice that when Cole just relaxes his hand, and he's doing a really great job, if I flex his wrist, the fingers naturally extend. And as I extend his wrist, his fingers naturally bend down. Notice that all the fingers, for the most part, are very parallel, and they all kind of point towards the base of the thumb or that scaphoid tubercle. This tenodesis principle and this um, observation of tenodesis is really important in kids. 
and, and will give you lots of clues when it comes to displaced fractures or tendon injury. So say, for example, Cole had cut one of the flexor tendons to his ring finger. Instead of his hand sitting as it is, that ring finger would be sitting unlike its neighbors in a more extended position. And at the same time, if I were to Tina Deese's wrist, instead of all the fingers coming down nicely, that ring finger would stay out straight because there's no tendinous connection. So abnormalities in tenodesis will give you lots of information about flexor tendon injuries. In addition, because sometimes bones break and they twist as opposed to just bending, sometimes you get in a situation where a bone can be broken and the finger twisted. So if you look at it straight on, it looks pretty straight. But only with tenodesis will you see that that twisted finger will overlap or underlap its neighbors. And so using the tenodesis maneuver helps you look for rotational deformities in the hand as well. So you can get a lot of information about the hand um, with inspection. Just one final um, maneuver that you can do during inspection, oftentimes the real little ones, they don't want you to touch their hands while they're hurting and it's hard to know if the flexor tendons are injured or not. So in a sneaky way sometimes you can rub or touch the forearm, staying away from a potential zone of injury in the hand and by just pressing on the muscle bellies where the flexor tendons are, notice that I can make Cole's hands and fingers flex. So therefore, I know that the tendinous connections between the muscles and the bones here are still working. If someone or a child had a cut here, they wouldn't let me near the hand, didn't even let me want to tenodice them. Simply by pressing the muscle bellies here, I could get a lot of information about whether those tendons are still intact.